along with the excitement of it being Easter, uh, it is also a, uh, an anniversary for us as we celebrate uh, 10 years since we started publicly. Uh, we had our public launch on Easter Sunday, 2006, and uh, we just look back with, with tremendous um, sense of awe and appreciation at how God has just been so generous uh, with us and so good and gracious to us as a, as a church body. If you uh, get a chance after service, um, there's a beautiful mural. I believe there's a picture of it up, up top here. Um, of, of um, our, yeah, cool. So that looks really awesome. But when you go like really close to it, there are the faces of people who have been a part of our church from day one on uh, just splashed all across uh, that, that design. And it's just such a really uh, awesome thing because the Integrity Church is not a person. Uh, Integrity Church is the people that make us who we are, and, and we're so thankful to God for that. And those who, are, who, who have been from the past and, and the present are kind of all on there on display. And so it's just a really uh, great time of celebration, and, and we just give God all the praise and glory for that. And so uh, happy anniversary, uh, Integrity Church. Uh, for those of you who know me, I, I, um, I love sports. Uh, I've been playing them and watching them for as long as I can remember. Uh, there's nothing like the, the competition uh, that takes place between two people or, or two individuals that are practicing all week long and, and sacrificing their body to, to get the win, you know, and, and, and just doing and making whatever adjustments were necessary so that they might get the win, right? How many, how many kind of like the, the, the big game and then just the, the idea of, 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 of the competition and all the, uh, the, the fun stuff that comes along with that? Um, there's two kinds of games that I really enjoy watching. Um, I love watching those, those neck and neck games kind of games. The, the ones that can kind of go one way or another, those nail biters that, that just kind of like, it's just going back and forth all game long, and you just don't know which way it's going to go, and it goes into overtime or sudden death, and you're at the edge of your seat, and then finally, you know, the goal gets put through, or and points get put on the board, and there's like an incredible victory that takes place, and just the adrenaline of, of those last minute, the, the battle of, of, of that takes place on the, on the turf or the ice or the, re, the rink or, or wherever it is. How many like those kinds of games, those, those nail biter kind of games? It's like, man, I didn't see that coming. I love those kind of games. The other kind of game that I really like is I love the total blowout. I really do. I, I, I love, not because I like to see a, a, a losing team completely devastated, unless it's Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. I, they really, that'd be a good thing. Um, <laughs> But, but I love to see two teams you know, that are coming together. I love to see a team that just peaks during a game. That, that just, is, you know, when they're coming together and they're, they're firing on every cylinder and, you know, they, they burn a 50 on the scoreboard. And it's like, I'm just like, man, just keep putting it on there. I just, I just love to see a complete blowout. Not because, I, honestly, not because I want to see the losing team humiliated, but there's just something about watching that team hit its highest moment. That just really kind of gets me like, like man, they, they just they nailed it today. How many like those kind of games, right? It's, it's not at the loser's expense, right? Um, but it's just like you just rejoice with this team that just went over and above everybody's expectations and, and created this amazing blowout. I love to see conquerors more than conqueror on the field. And as we come to... Easter celebration 2016. I want to remind you that God knows how to win. And I want to tell you, God wins big. God goes over the top. It's not a nail biter, squeaker, overtime kind of a victory. It is an all, it is an all consuming win on God's end. In fact, when God is in the game, there's no overtime. There's no, there's no neck and neck wins. There's no squeak it out victories. There's, there's no last minute shootouts or coin tosses. When God wins, he wins over the top, decisively, effectively, and leaves no room for questions. And you see, that's what Easter's all about. God won. And God won big. God won big. Give him praise. It's about victory 
Easter is. It's about triumph. It's about God winning over sin and recognizing for us that the prize of that win is you and me. God got in the game not because he needed to become a victor. Listen to me. God was always victorious. God didn't need to kind of strut his stuff. God got into the game to win you and me. And you see, to truly appreciate Easter, we must consider it through the lens of the garden. In fact, I think in order for us to consider anything that God has done for us, we we need to consider it through the lens of the garden. Back to the beginning. Because unless we understand the context of why God did what God did, it, 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 it enhances, when we understand the context, it enhances our appreciation. It helps us to realize just how awesome and how great and how majestic God is. And so for for us to consider and appreciate Easter, the Resurrection Sunday, we need to consider it from the lens of of the garden because it was in the garden that that everything that was good went bad. Everything got messed up because man who was created in the image of God, who was designed to have relationship with his creator, he went against the command of Almighty God. We see in Genesis chapter two, the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. It was clear. It was understood. And it was gracious. Everything else was there for the, theirs for the taking. This one restriction served as a reminder that God is God and we are to follow his commands. Everything was theirs for them to enjoy and to remind them that they were stewards of the garden and not owners of the garden. God said, you can have everything but this. Don't touch this. That restriction served as a reminder that they were stewards of the garden and not owners of the garden. But they didn't listen. They went against God. They defied his command. And that same one who defied God before time began, Lucifer, that one who who at one time led angels in worship before the throne. Satan, who desired to to rise above God in preeminence, he declared, I will ascend above the throne of God. I will be like the Most High. There was no war. There was no debate. There was no, just God kicked him out. And God kicked him out of heaven. That's because he was trying to be like God. That same one slithers his way into the garden and says to Eve, go against God. Did God really say not to eat of the tree? I'm like, yeah, he really did. Did God really say, he says in chapter 3, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of the tree, your eyes will be opened. And you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He's afraid, God is, that you're going to be like him. Go ahead and eat the fruit. Hey, that's what Satan wanted, to be like God. And so he uses his own desire and puts it on them and says, you can eat the tree. God's just afraid it's going to make you like him. You know the end of the story. The effects of that moment 
have played out over the course of time as, as sin entered the world and has ravaged the beauty of all that God has created? We see it all around us today. Hatred is on the rise all over the world. People are angry. We see nations rising against nations, people rising against people. Why is that? Because sin entered into the world. And that sin is manifesting itself over the course of time in anger and hatred and outright rebellion towards God. We see sickness and disease and starvation and all kinds of, of tragedy in the world around us. And, and it, asks, it causes us to ask the question, why? I'm sure you've heard the question hurled at you at one time or another. If God is so loving, why would he allow such tragedy? Why would he condone such hatred and anger. It's not that God condones it. He set in motion a plan, a design at the beginning of time that would keep us from experiencing any of the hardships, any of the consequences of sin. God put in motion a plan that would protect us from experiencing those things. But the problem was man turned against God. God didn't break the rules, man did. Man bought into the lie. Man decided to disobey God's laws despite the clear instruct that in the day you eat of this, you shall surely die. Man turned his back on God in the garden and man has continued to turn his back on God ever since. For the one who would say, well, that's just not fair. You mean to tell me that Adam is representing all of us? I mean, if I was Adam, I wouldn't have done that. And yet we do it all the time, don't we? We do. We follow our own way. Isaiah was right when he said, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one turns to his own way. But there's good news to the story. No, that's not why you came out on Easter Sunday morning to hear just the, 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 the bad stuff. I thank God that that's just a part of the story. But it is a significant part. Because in order for us to really appreciate the good news, we got to understand the bad news. And the bad news is really bad. But you see, moments after this event took place in the garden, we see God set in motion the plan of redemption. A plan that will reverse the curse. A plan that will, that will do away with sin and its con consequences. A plan that will do away with sickness and disease and starvation and cancer and all that we see that is devastating the world around us. You see, they were never part of God's design. It wasn't God who put this in motion, but they were the consequences of man turning their back on God. But at that very moment that it took place, God puts in plan, in place, a plan, a, motion, a promise that one would come, one who would crush the head of the serpent, Satan, and all that he represents, and all that sin's tentacles have reached out to. We read about that right in the beginning, right after the fall. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God is speaking to Satan. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God is letting us know right from the beginning, the, the beginning that there's a plan in place that will reverse that which was lost in the garden. It was set in motion. God's plan of redemption was settled and it would be finalized in the, in the coming of a Messiah. One who would, would reverse the curse from the garden and restore everything the way God designed for it to be. 
All the prophets pointed to that day. All of the systems in the Old Testament that were in place, that served as lenses that we would look through to see the Messiah. God was setting the stage for the biggest win that humanity will ever see. It was not going to be a squeaker. It wasn't going to be an overtime win or a decision made by a third party. You say, well, wait a minute, but they, they did get Jesus on the cross. I mean, they, they nailed him too. They spit on his face. They beat him. Ultimately, they killed him. That looks like a victory for the bad guys. Not at all. I submit to you, God was completely in control of every moment that took place at Golgotha. They were not calling the shots. God was. In fact, centuries before Roman crucifixion was even created, the psalmist lays out for us the kind of death the Messiah would experience as it speaks about, with precision accuracy, the nails going through his hands and his feet and, the, and, and his, his side being pierced. Clearly speaking about crucifixion centuries before the Romans even invented it. Surely the Romans were not in charge at that moment. Jesus made it very clear in John chapter 10 when he said, nobody takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I've got authority to take it up again. This charge, he says, I've received from my father. And so Jesus was not the victim at Calvary that day. Jesus was the victor before Calvary, during Calvary, and after Calvary. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so here's the part that we, we need to wrap our arms around because we're bound in this arena called time. But what Jesus did at Calvary took place over time. It extends beyond time. And here's the part that we need to wrap our arms around that what was being played out on Golgotha was not a battle for victory. It was the carrying out of the victory by the Son of God, who is a victor all the time. It was already settled and secured moments after sin entered into the garden. What Jesus did on the cross took place above time. Now, we have a hard time reconciling that because we are bound within time. But Jesus took care of it all above time. And so how was this victory carried out? How could God maintain his holiness, which demands punishment for sin, while at the same time reverse the curse that was in the garden? He would become the curse for you and me. How would he reverse the curse? He would become the curse. The scripture says, cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God stepped into time to put in motion a win for us for all of eternity. The plan for victory included God becoming man, living a sinless life, ultimately being the only person not born of Adam who had earned his way into heaven, fulfilling every command that was set forth. And where Adam dropped the ball, Jesus picked it up and ran to the cross for you and for me. Jesus took upon himself the, the punishment that was directed towards us upon himself. He absorbed the, the full wrath of God for all of our sin. When we talk about this idea of being saved, right, we use that so sometimes so flippant, like, I, I'm, yeah, I'm saved. Well, what are you saved from? We're saved from the wrath of Almighty God. 
Man is born under the wrath. John the Apostle, in, 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 in quoting the words of Jesus, Jesus said, he that has the Son has life. But he who does not have the Son shall not see life. And the wrath of God abides on him. And so when we talk about this idea of being saved, we are being saved from the wrath of Almighty God. And as Jesus hung on that cross and fully absorbed the wrath of God himself, all of our sin, all of the consequences for our actions, every one of those sins, Jesus took them upon himself. And as he cried out, it is finished. It means paid in full. He absorbed all of the punishment for our sins and the wrath that was directed towards us is turned into favor from God. What an amazing transfer that takes place. Our disposition before God went from being under God's wrath to being under God's love and mercy and acceptance because of the Son. But it didn't stop there. Not only did Jesus die on the cross for us, but he showed that his power over death, he showed us that power by rising from the dead three days later. The risen Christ Resurrection Sunday Easter shows us that the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf was fully accepted and the consequences of sin that were heading our way were completely paid in full by Jesus. The account that was overdrawn for us because of our sin was paid in full by Jesus. All the sin and the consequences of those who would call upon the name of the Lord were put on Jesus, and that's the key. For those who don't call upon the name of the Lord, they still are under the wrath of God. They will still absorb the consequences for their own sins. It is only in recognizing that he and he alone is our substitute. He is the only means by which we can gain favor from God. He is our only way of moving from the wrath of God to the acceptance of God. Not a church. Not your church attendance. Not how much you give in an offering. Not how nice you are or anything else. It's nothing we can do. It is solely based on the merits of Jesus Christ. Religion gets in the way of what the message of Jesus was all about. Can I, that's, a, that's the reality. Jesus never came to establish a, re, establish a religion. He came so that man would be redeemed back to God. That we'd find our purpose and value in God and recognize how much God loves us, loves us so much that he came in the person of Jesus Christ to take care of our biggest problem so that we might spend our forever with him. Listen to what Paul writes to the church at Colossae. He says, In you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Nailing what? to the cross, the record of debt that stood against us. Here is what the record of debt looks like. The record of debt looks like the sin nature that has been passed on to you in Adam. It continues beyond that though. If we consider every area of sin that we have been a part of goes on to our debt. How many had a really huge debt? There was a record of debt that we accumulated over time. But Jesus stepped in. This is a love message, folks. This is all about love. This is all about God's mercy. 
And Jesus stepped in and took that record of debt that was, that was against you. Imagine it was your name on there and there's a list of all the things that you've done and a list of what you were outside of Jesus. And every one of those things brings you to the conclusion that you are going to be separated from God forever. But Jesus steps in and he takes that record of debt and he nails it to the cross and he gives you a clean slate. A, a do-over. I don't know about you, but that, there's no greater news than that. That's the good news of the gospel. God steps in and cleanses us by the blood of Jesus. And then I love it, he says, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in it. He made a spectacle of Satan by triumph. You know, you know how he did that? The scripture says that he is the accuser of the brethren. You ever have him whisper in your ear that you're, you're garbage? You ever have him tell you that you've gone too far? that God doesn't love you, that God doesn't care about you, that you've sinned, you've messed up, you've ruined it, and you start walking around thinking, man, I'm a total mess. That's the stuff that the Satan wants you to do. And what Jesus does is, is he makes a fool of him by taking the record of debt and, and, and nailing it to the cross and granting righteousness so that all the accusations that were made against you by Satan are null and void. He makes a public spectacle of him. Not only did Jesus win, he won big, over the top, without question. He makes an absolute fool of the accuser of the brethren by triumphing over him. And check this out. Jesus did not become the conqueror that day. Jesus was always the conqueror. He was always the conqueror. His power and authority and deity were not held in the balance that day at Calvary. It wasn't so much about Jesus' victory. He was always victorious. Hebrews says he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. What was secured that day was your victory and my victory through Jesus Christ. Because we were incapable of securing our own victory because in Adam, we had already lost the battle. But Jesus stepped in. And Jesus secured that victory for us. So now we too are victorious as well. Easter is a reminder for you that, and I that we too are victorious. But our victory is not based on our own merits. We need to make very clear understanding of that. Our victory is not to do with our own efforts, our own works, but the efforts of the one that secure them for us. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. He is the central person of all that exists. I love what Paul writes to the church at Rome. He says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, that's what we're focusing on at this time of year, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? What a powerful statement here. What he's basically saying here is he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. It's like, God's not going to go through the motions of giving up his son and allowing all of his wrath to be poured out on his son just to forget about you and me. He's not going to leave you behind. He's going to complete that work. That's what Paul said. I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And if he did not spare his own son but gave, us up, gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's not possible. That record of debt has been nailed to the cross already. It is God who justifies. 
Who is to condemn? Christ is the one who died. He took the condemnation that was on against us already upon himself. More than that, he was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or sword? No, he says. He comes to the conclusion after seeing all that Christ has done and said, no, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conqueror. You're not just a conqueror. You're a more than a conqueror. Through him, by the way, who loved us. We recognize that we are conquerors through him. We are not conquerors outside of him. We are conquerors only through him. And he said, for I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels or rulers or things present or things to come or powers or height or death or anything else in creation, he says, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. This, this verse needs to be seen through the lens of the garden because as we consider what took place when sin entered the world, when man went against God, it resulted in separation from God. The first Adam brought separation. The second Adam brought reconciliation. The first Adam brought death. The second Adam brought life. The first Adam brought judgment. The, first, the second Adam brought hope and reconciliation and healing and a future. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. It is the reverse of the curse. The security of the believer is directly connected to the work of Christ on the cross. You didn't earn the love of God and you can't lose the love of God. You are completely his and nothing can snatch you out of his hands. He loves you. And a lot of people say, well, you say that and people are, gonna, people are just going to live sloppy lives. You know what? I find more people that need to be encouraged by that because they beat themselves up all the time. Oh, I dropped the ball. God doesn't love me. They grow up in an arena where, where they, they feel like, you know, they got, that, that God's love for them is only, is dependent on how good they are. Really? Look at that. That's why God gave us the children of Israel in the Old Testament. God's faithfulness was not displayed to them because they'd been faithful, right? They were like us. And I find tremendous encouragement that nothing can separate you. Nothing. Maybe you're here this morning, you think, did I go too far? Does God love me? Does God care about me? Does he know where I'm at? Does he care about the things that, that I've gone through? Does he know my hurt? Does he know my pain? I want to tell you this morning, God loves you. He truly loves you. As my brother Ken said this morning, if you were the only one, he'd have come just for you. It is so true. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the benchmark of the Christian faith. Everything rises and falls on the resurrection. If you can disprove the resurrection, you can disprove all of Christianity. All of Christianity falls like a straw house. It is the benchmark, the cornerstone. All that Jesus taught was substantiated when he rose from the dead. No wonder God rolled the, tomb away, the, the stone away so that we can go in and see that he had risen indeed. Every verse about eternal hope in the scripture, about peace, about love, about reconciliation, everything that we hold dear in this book. I mean, think about what we're, what we're, what we're, you know, um, how much trust we're putting in the words of Jesus. I mean, I'm putting my eternity, my eternal future. I'm banking it all. All of my emotional eggs are in that basket. The resurrection proves 
that all that he said is true and can be depended upon. Paul writes to the church of Corinth, and he says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, Paul says, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, Paul says that not even Christ is raised from the dead. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile. It's a waste of time. He says you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. They're lost if this stuff isn't true. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, they've got a situation. He says in verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we amongst all men are most pitiful. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by one man came death, by a man also is, has, the, has come the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die. So also in Christ shall all be made alive. I mean, that right there, verse 22, it's the message of the gospel. For in Adam all die. For in Christ all live. Choose life. Choose life. You see, what started in the garden is reversed at the cross and is pronounced at the empty tomb. The tomb is open. Case closed. Case closed. Easter points to the truth that Jesus not only conquered death, hell, and the grave as a demonstration of his power over them, but he conquered them so that you and I would live as victorious overcomers in Jesus Christ. His victory extends to those who put their trust in him. And we, like Paul said, are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. That means we no longer would be without hope. We no longer are without purpose. We no longer are without joy or peace or direction or a sense of value or, or lacking an eternal destination in heaven. But because of the resurrection, all is well. And we have purpose and joy and peace and direction and a sense of value. Jesus, in speaking to those who were at the tomb of Lazarus that day, he asks the question, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he looks him in the eye and he says, do you believe this? The resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us every reason to believe this. It is a faith that is founded on historical logical, evidential proof that the tomb was empty and he who was dead is alive again. And because he lives, we shall live for him, with him and for him for all of eternity. The resurrection, it's the benchmark of our faith. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we who were so undeserving have been recipients of the greatest gift in the person of Jesus Christ. We thank you that the resurrection is not just something that we have to believe by faithing it but we thank you that there is such logical proof over the centuries that point to the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is unrefutable. 
And Lord, we thank you that our hearts can receive that truth, that our minds can perceive it and bow to that reality. Father, I pray for anyone here today that does not and has not accepted the free gift of God in Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and maybe you're that person who wondered and wrestled with this idea of the love of God, would God accept me? Did Jesus die for me? I want to tell you this morning, a resounding yes. He died for you. He loves you. And if you've never come to a point in your life where you recognize your need for a Savior, I can't think of a better time than Easter Sunday morning than to take that moment of pause and saying, God, I put all my trust in you and you alone. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I want to make that commitment today. Will you pray for me? As Christians are praying and nobody's looking around, let's just take a moment and, of pause and is there anybody here to say, Pastor, will you pray for me? I want to start fresh in my, my relationship with God today. Will you pray for me? I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand. Amen. Anybody else? I see your hand. I see your hand in the back as well. I see your hand, buddy. All over this place. The resurrection is about life. Let's choose life in Jesus Christ. Is there anybody else before I pray? I don't want to leave anybody out. Christians are praying. This is the, the presence of the God is here. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. In Adam, we receive death. In Christ, we see, receive life. In Adam, there's judgment. In Jesus, there's acceptance. In Adam, there's hell. In Jesus, there's heaven. Is there anybody else before I pray? If that was you, you raised your hand this morning. I'm just going to pray a simple prayer. It's not a magical prayer, um, but I want to lead you in a prayer that if you mean it with your heart, I believe with all my heart that God will meet you and hear your prayer and change your disposition before God. I'm going to ask you to repeat it. I'm going to ask you if everybody would repeat after me, just as a sign of, of affirmation that we do believe this. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I, believe I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you came to the earth, came to the earth. Born, of a born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, a sinless life. And, died and died on the cross for me. For me. I am a sinner. And I ask that you forgive me. That you'd come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've prayed that for the first time, please let the person that you know here know about that or come and see one of us up here. We'd love to just talk with you more about growing in your faith with Jesus. But here's the deal, and, and here's, here's, here's the radicalness of what takes place here. That, if, that if, if you meant that with all your heart, and you, you, you came in this morning in Adam, and you're leaving in Christ, there is a miracle that takes place. It is an absolute miracle that takes place. What took place in you is the reason Christ came. And how many have been recipients of that great gift from God. Let's stand together as we, with great joy and great excitement and great conviction, go to our closing song, which I think is going to remind us of the aliveness that's in us in Jesus Christ. Amen.